folks. Welcome back to another episode of Unfinished Business Television. Uh, this is our interview uh, episode uh, that we are lucky enough to bring you once in a while. Um, I am your host, Jeff Gallishaw, at Unfinished V1. And with me, as always, is Andre Joseph of AJ Epics. I'm a cowboy on a steel horse I ride. <laughs> I know that song. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously, we have a special guest with us today. You might notice uh, he has done it all, directed music clips before there was officially MTV or music videos as we know them. He has directed short films, documentary, television series, as well as theatrical films and TV movies. Not only that, he's a noted screenwriter, producer, showrunner, whose career has spanned across decades. Though is an artist and creator at heart. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have Gary Sherman as a guest with us today. Thank, Thank you. you. You make me blush. He <laughs> <laughs> uh, says, this is your life in film. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long one, I'll tell you that. <laughs> oh, yeah. but a great one. Mm. Yeah, it's been fun. I, I, you know, most people are lucky to have 25 years as a career, and um, I'm going on 55 years at this point. So, <laughs> hey, it shows your talent and your gusto. <laughs> well, it shows my tenacity, anyways. <laughs> True. <laughs> So Gary, like I always ask all of our guests when we begin, uh, how did you get started in filmmaking? Um, accidentally, um, I was uh, I was studying photography at the Institute of Design, and um, we were fortunate to have Aaron Siskin come, uh, who you know basically is the father of modern photography. Uh, to to work uh, to lecture us at, at the school, and he gave us an assignment of um, shooting people at work, and uh, he, you know he 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 was talking about it in a very abstract way, but anyways I had this I had found an old Aeroflex, um, sixteen millimeter camera in in a closet at the school and i had rebuilt it and got it to work and i was just playing with it so when aaron gave us that assignment i said god could i shoot this on film and he said well i don't care what you know the content is he says and i'm going to judge it as a photograph not as a movie but you you're you know fine to do that well, I was working my way through school as a session musician at Chess Records. I was kind of the, the token white at Chess Records. Um, and in fact, nobody knew my name. Everybody just used to call me the white kid. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I was booked on a session with Bo Diddley. And um, so uh, me and Minnie Ripperton were singing background on a Bo Diddley album. And so I said to Bo, I said, you know, do you mind if I shoot some some footage of you, you know, while we're doing this? And he said, what's it for? I said, it's just for school. And he said, yeah, that's cool, man. He said, I like getting my picture taken. So that, that's cool. So I'm I'm in there when I'm not in the booth. I'm I'm in the in the studio with my Aeroflex and just shooting you know, footage of, of everybody in the, in the session. And um, Marshall Chess walks in, who is the son of, of, you know, one of the Chess brothers. And Marshall says to me, you know, he knew me. He said, Sherman, what are you doing? I said, it's for school. He said, oh, that's cool, but I want to see it. So anyway, so a couple of days later, I dragged the 16 millimeter projector down to his office at, at chest and put my dailies up on the on the wall because <laughs> there was no screen. And he goes, 
I love this stuff. This is great. I've never seen anything that looked like this. So he called his dad and his uncle and everybody else in and said, you guys got to look at this. You got to look at this. And all his A&R people. And he said, look at, look at what he did. And so he, then he says to me, he says, let's make a movie. I said, I don't know anything about making a movie. He said, I'll hire everybody. You just do what you're doing. Because, I mean, the footage was pretty, uh, it was pretty, off, uh, you know, off the wall for, for those days. You know, I mean, this was, you know, early 60s. And nobody was shooting stuff like, like what I was shooting. And so... He put a crew together for me and I got a leave of absence from school and I went off on the road with Bo Diddley for two weeks and just shot footage. And, um, you know, he sent a recording crew with me and I, I just, I was just shooting footage. And then I came back and he says, okay, I'm putting you in a cutting room. You got to cut it. <laughs> I didn't know how to cut it. And so he, he got me somebody that knew what they were doing and just showed me what to do and left me in the cutting room with a moviola. And I invited a couple of friends to help me and we put together a movie called The Legend of Bo Diddley. And um, Marshall sold it to like 75 television stations around the world. And uh, suddenly I had record companies calling me and saying, hey, would you shoot our group? Would you shoot our group? And do doop. And um, I did a couple of more things for chess. I did something with Ramsey Lewis and, and a little bit with Chuck Berry. And, um, you know, and it, suddenly I was getting calls from other record companies. And I got a call from Crescendo Records in California. And they wanted me to do something with a group called The Seeds. I don't know if you remember the seeds. They did it. They had a hit song called Pushing Too Hard. You're pushing too hard. You're pushing on me. You're pushing too hard the way you want me to be. And they were a flower power group. And that got me out to California. And I, I shot Sonny and Cher. And I shot some other people and um, with a camera. <laughs> and, um, and that, that led me into commercials. And boom, boom. And suddenly I was a filmmaker. Wow. Mm. So that that's my beginnings. I, I I had no it was basically the thing I did on the seeds that really opened up my career for me because uh somebody took it to the Aspen Design Conference to show it. And that's when I started getting calls to do commercials. And commercials took me to London and when I was in London, everybody said, you should shoot a movie, you should shoot a movie. And that's what happened. So <laughs> I shot my first movie, Deathline, in London. Uh, at the, I was, you know, in my early 20s and it was pretty amazing. <laughs> I want to ask about Deathline because for your first big movie, you have legends like Christopher Lee and Donald Pleasance in it. And I was wondering for you, coming from commercials and your documentary work, what kind of challenges did you face on that first project? Oh, it was amazing. I got to tell you, the first day on that picture, I walk into, we were, the first shots were in the Inspector Cahoon's office, Donald Pleasant's office. And I walk into the set and there's Donald Pleasant sitting behind the desk with his feet up on the desk and his arms crossed. And Norman Rossington sitting on the desk with his arms crossed. And they're both staring at me. And they say in unison, okay, boss, what do you want us to do? You talk about intimidating. Here's two <laughs> actors that had been in more movies than I had probably ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting there going, and they're testing me. And I, I guess I passed the test because by that afternoon, we were all hugging and doing it. And Donald was running and getting everybody tea. And I mean, at that time, Donald Pleasance was like, you know, the, the god of actors. And uh, 
to do. But how Christopher got in the picture was because Paul Maslansky was producing the film, and Paul had done a number of pictures with <laughs> with Chris, and um, so they were have Paul was in London to to produce my movie, and he was having dinner with Christopher. And Christopher said, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, I got this young kid that's making a movie that they, the Jay Cantor and Alan Ladd Jr. brought me in to produce. And um, uh, and he had the audacity to make an offer to Donald Pleasance. And Donald accepted his offer. <laughs> and Christopher looks at Paul and says, you're doing a movie with Donald Pleasance and I haven't had an offer? And Paul says, Chris, you cost more than the entire budget of this movie. And so Chris says, hey, you give me a scene where I don't have to wear the fangs. <laughs> and I can be a one-on-one -on -one with Donald Pleasance. I'll do it for free or for scale if we have to do it for scale. And, and Paul says, are you serious? And he said, absolutely. Paul picked up the phone and called me and he says, can you write a scene for Christopher Lee to do with Donald Pleasance that we can put in the film because we can have Christopher for free if, if we do that, or at least for scale. And that's what I did. And I, I wrote a scene, a one-on-one -on -one from a character who was an off-screen character and we put him on screen. <laughs> that's what we did did uh think christopher lee um was their relationship in that scene how they were in real life kind of rivalry or were they just like pleasure oh they loved each other i mean you know they both they respected each other immensely uh i mean you know christopher was a was a uh, a, a Shakespeare trained, you know, actor out of, you know, the, the, you know, from the highest levels. And then he got cast in those Hammer films and he had to make a living like everybody else, you know, and he took that and Dracula took over his life. And, I, you know, he he was happy about it and not happy about it at the same time. Donald, on the other hand, was the actor's actor. I mean, every actor just looked up to Donald Pleasance. I mean, he had done such amazing films. And actually, Deathline was the first horror film that basically that, that Donald had done, if you don't consider the early stuff that he did with Polanski um, horror films. But I mean, but Donald did Deathline because we only sent him the page. He wanted to do a comedy, and we only sent him his pages when we first made the offer to him. And he he loved the character. And then I met with him and told him, I said, you know, it is actually a horror film. He says, I don't care. He said, I don't care what the other scenes are. He says, I love the scenes you wrote for me. And, uh, and that's why I'm going to do it. And um, so, <laughs> and working with the two of them was great. Except that, you know, Donald's about five foot tall and, and Christopher's about seven feet tall. <laughs> Not really, but, um, <laughs> but, 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 and, and I realized I was doing a one on one with the two of them <laughs> and I had to figure out how to shoot it. So if you've seen Deathline, you know what the solution was <laughs> to that problem. Where do you, uh, you said you're like, you grew up and were more of a student of photography. Where did the screenwriting and story? Uh, more come from mm. it was you know what my best friend and my producer um, when I was doing commercials in London was Jonathan Demi and and Jonathan was producing commercials that's how we met and we just became best friends and um, uh, Do Jonathan at that time had no want to direct but he wanted to write and um, John and I started writing together. We wrote a whole bunch of scripts because he was the one that was pushing me. He was the one that kept saying to me, you should be directing movies. You should be directing movies. And, um, and he says, and I'll produce you. And uh, so anyways, we, we just started writing stuff. And 
we had written us we got hired <laughs> john and i got hired by ray davies from the kinks ray wanted to be in a movie and and we, we had written all these very political scripts and he, he wanted to do something political. That's why we never got any of them made because they were like really very left wing kind of, you know, on the nose kind of preaching to the to the choir kind of scripts. And so Ray said, you know, I want to do something. So we came up with an idea and uh, Jonathan and Carrie Jones, who became my writing partner on Deathline. Um, the three of us and another guy named David Chaston, who was an art director and was part of our company. Um, we sat down with Ray and came up with an idea and, and we wrote a script called, um, oh, what was it called? I'll think of it in a minute. <laughs> uh, turned over and um, where he played a guy who was a, a kind of anti-social kind of guy who, who stole things on order. People would tell him what he wanted, but it was very political and it got into a whole thing. Anyhow, we wrote the script. We took the script to Hemdale, which was John Daly and, and David Hemming's company. And uh, they loved, they said, you got Ray Davies? And we said, yeah. And of course, you know, there there was the, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones and the Kinks. I mean, those were the three biggest groups in the world at the time. And um, uh, they said, if you got Ray Day and, you know, and obviously the Beatles were, had, had done movies and, um, and and Mick Jagger was starring in movies. And so they said, yeah, Ray Davies. Yeah, that'd be great. So. They made us a deal and we were actually in pre-production when Dave Davies, you know, Ray's brother, said to him, you're either a rock star or a movie star, you can't fucking be both. Oh, and man. and he said, no, nah, man, he said, we got, a, we got, you know, we got our rehearsals to do, we got tours we're doing, we got records to cut, you know, you can't go off and make a movie. So Ray calls us and says, my brother, um is like adamant that i don't do the movie and so uh at least for now i can't do the movie and john daly ends up canceling the movie he said and he said john you like the script he says i didn't like the script i liked ray davies he said the script's really well written but without ray davies we don't have a movie here he said why don't you write something i can actually make like a horror movie and so i said that oh God, what a better place to hide political commentary than 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 in a horror movie. And I, I just had never thought about that. And so the whole idea of Deathline came to me because I could do a whole treatise on racism, on on, on classism, and 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 hide it inside a horror film and only those who wanted to see it could see it. And those who wanted to just see a horror movie could go see a horror movie. And that was what Deathline was. And I think that's why now 52 years later, people are still watching Deathline because they realize the message of the movie. So there was like a little bit of a, of a gap for a while after Deathline. I mean, I know you've written some stuff, but um, how did Dead and Barry come about? When... You know, my, well, I was having a very successful career in commercials and um, I made a day doing commercials what I was make what I made on Deathline <laughs> altogether. And, uh, you know, which was like a lot longer than a day. Um, and so what happened was, you know, like Deathline was a huge hit in Europe. But then when it went to America, it was bought by AIP, Sam Arkoff. At, at AIP, it was, and he said, oh, this picture's too fucking intelligent, and we got to tone it down, and we got to, they took out the tracking shot, because they said nobody could sit through an eight-minute shot, so they cut up the tracking shot, they revoiced Donald Pleasance, because they didn't think anybody could understand what he was saying, they took out all the social commentary, and they just turned it into a film that they called Raw Meat. 
and they distributed it as as raw meat from AIP. And um, uh, there, there was just there there was an article in the Village Voice that said butchered turning deathline into raw meat don't go see this movie until you can see deathline because raw meat is not something that you should that you should see and um boom, boom. anyhow I, I got really discouraged by all of that I, I i hated what they had done to my movie and i just said you know they don't do that to me in commercials you know i mean i don't get recut when I'm doing commercials or music videos, why, you know, why do I want to subject myself to that? And so I just kept doing music movies and, you know, music films, and they weren't called videos back then, but music films and, um, uh, and commercials. And, um, you know, and then I moved to Los Angeles from London and um uh, one day ron chusette comes knocking at my door and he, he just blew me away ron was one of the most enthusiastic people i'd ever met in my life he was just fucking nutcase and he gives me this pile of scripts and then he says do you have any scripts you want to sell me he says i i, I need some scripts and uh Anyways, I ended up selling him Phobia, which I had written when I was in England, and I sold it to them, and they, they made it up in Canada. But um, one of the scripts that Ron gave me was um, was Dead and Buried, an early draft of Dead and Buried, and I just really loved it. And Ron just kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me and said, we'll rewrite it, whatever you want in it, and da 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 so he and I worked on that script, and then Alien was released. He was making Alien when I first met him, and Alien got released, and Alien became a huge success. And uh, actually, the first weekend when Alien opened, Ronnie called me. He said, "I think we're going to get Dead and Buried made." <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, we had a deal on Dead and Buried within a week of Alien opening, and um, to do, and so. Uh, you know, it was only because I wanted to work with Ron was probably the only reason I came back to doing feature films again. I've only recently watched Dead and Barry for the first time, forgive me. I've heard about it all over the years. But one of the things that struck me was like, there's this great intro with Lisa, I think, Blount? Blount, Blount yeah. yeah okay. Who ended up as an Oscar winner, you know, for yeah. a documentary that she did. Oh man, uh, she like you like reveal her making the audience fall for her and like in all these angles through the photographer's lens, and you know then you kind of yank the curtains back and reveal what this is all really about. And no, and one of the great things I like about all your films is that they're all kind of like that, you know, where it's like you think it's gonna go one way and then. You know, it reveals something surprising about them, even, you know, uh, through like Wanted, Dead or Alive, you know, all your films are usually like that. Maybe not, obviously not after the shot, because that's based on a true story. But, you know, I just that was the thing that struck me with like the beauty of that shot and uh, or those shots and then like the reveal and then, you know, the rest of the movie, which is like a roller coaster ride. So uh, I just I really love. It. Well, thank you. Yeah, I like creating roller coasters. I mean that that's uh, that's why I think you know Poltergeist three is my least favorite of my movies. It was uh, I I didn't really want to do that movie, and I I and I'm actually my whole life I've been sorry that I did do that movie. Although there's a lot of people who really love that movie. Um. But uh, <clears throat> Jay, and, Jay and Laddie, who gave me Deathline, were running MGM, and they called me and said, we want you to do Poltergeist 3. And I said, no, thank you. And we finally got around to the, they They talked me into it. But anyways, getting back, I mean, yeah, Deathline, I mean, starting out with the guy walking through Soho looking at prostitutes and ba-boom, and you go, 
and and the music's kind of the stripper you know bow, bow. Yeah. and um you know which was really fun working with will malone he, he was such he's such a great he's still around and he's still doing great stuff um and uh electric bicycle i think is his group now but um anyhow uh yeah i mean that you know that worked for me and when when we started on dead and buried that was the other thing that i wanted to do was just kind of lull the audience with that piano piece that that Joe Renzetti wrote to open it, and it's just so lyrical and romantic, and bump, 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 and you don't know where you're going to go, and then suddenly they're burning this guy alive, um, and then you know, then we open up the rest of the film, and and it, and it is the same in in Wanted, Dead or Alive. Uh, I, I mean, I, I've done it in so many of my films, Vice Squad. You talk about a roller coaster ride. Vice Squad is my my real. Uh, it's so many people that really love. I mean, you know, S Marty Scorsese is just a huge Vice Squad fan. Spielberg was a huge Vice Squad. John Milius was a huge Vice Squad fan. I mean, and so and then down through the. Edgar Wright is is a huge Vice Squad fan. He told me Edgar told me that when he did uh, Baby Driver, he made everybody on the crew watch Vice Squad because he said, "I want that kind of power in this movie." <laughs> and I, I actually have he he sent me a, a a poster of Baby Driver and said, "Thank you for Vice Squad," <laughs> which he signed on the poster so um <laughs> doo doo but uh yeah I, I i like really hard driving stuff and um, yeah, definitely you know but you know vice squad i think is still one of my favorite of my children you're not supposed to pick a favorite of your children <laughs> uh yeah i definitely saw that movie way too young but i loved it back then and i still love it. i think i understand it now the probably first because when i first saw it i was probably about like 10 years old and to this day i always remember wing hauser's sh blue shirt is burned into my retina that shirt <laughs> <laughs> um i'm just um i, I um the song <laughs> wings hauser sings was that written by him and was it always meant to be in the film? And yes, it wasn't written by him. It was uh, we were it was this the Sunday night before we were going in to record music. I'm over at Joe Renzetti's house and Simon Stokes, the lyricist, was there. And we were talking and we just said, God, should we do a a song to start the movie because i mean you know we we've got this se i had already shot the sequence and they'd seen the sequence and um, i cut the sequence to some music but uh, we were trying to figure out the music that we were going to actually put to the sequence and um and we said you know why don't we write a song and simon says i got it i said what's that and he said neon slime <laughs> wow he said another body and he just came out with the line another body floating in the neon slime and joe and i just went crazy over it and so the three of us sat down and on that sunday night in an hour the three of us wrote that song i mean i i was directing uh you know i mean i i credit joe and simon with writing the song and they wrote it and then joe wanted me to sing it <laughs> you know because I, I, I you know i mean i was a singer I, you know that's what i did at chess i was a background singer yeah i was a doo -wah girl <laughs> <laughs> and um uh and so <clears throat> we talked about it and i said you know what 
Because that's how I knew Wings. I, I had known Wings before Vice Squad because Wings and I used to play guitar and sing together, just, you know, fucking around. His wife was a friend of mine. His wife was in Dead and Buried. That's how I originally met Wings. Okay. Nancy Hauser, who plays the mom of the little boy in the haunted house scene. Wings, mm -hmm. That was Wings' wife. And... um so when when we were up in Mendocino making Dead and Buried, which we were there forever making Dead and Buried, which was really fun, um, Wings used to come up to spend weekends with Nancy, and he and I would get together with our guitars and sing. And I knew Wings had a great voice. So we're heading to the studio, and I said, you know what, let's get Wings to sing this. I don't want to fucking sing this. Let's get <laughs> Wings to sing it. He's a better singer than I am. And so uh, I called him and I said, what are you doing? He said, I don't know. I said, get down to Evergreen Studios. He said, why? He said, you're going to sing a song. <laughs> he said, okay. <laughs> and ba-boom, and we went into the studio and we just recorded it. No, oh, man, so. that is. <laughs> um, is uh, Wayne's Hauser as intense on set as he was in singing that song and in his performance? It was strange. Wing, Wings um, had never played a villain before. Uh, Wings was in soap operas, and he was in one soap opera, The Young and the Restless, where he played a character named Greg Foster, who was like the world's nicest person. And, But I knew Wings, and I knew that there was an intensity inside of him that he'd never put on the screen, nor did he want to put on the screen. And I, I pulled it out of him. He was angry at me for a long time about me making him as evil in that picture because he, he had a hard time with it. He had a hard time, but boy, he was, <laughs> and he also made me promise that I'd never let him go home from the set as Ramrod. I'd have to send him home as Wings. He wanted to go home as Greg Foster. He didn't want to go home as Ramrod. And so, we sh we only shot at night on that movie. That whole film takes place in one night. We it was all locations, so we only shot at night, and we wrap at about five o'clock in the morning when the sun started coming up. And I had to find a bar that was open at five in the morning so that I could take wings, and and have a drink with them, so that I could bring them back from being ramrod to being greg foster and i did that every morning when we finished shooting Damn. so i i promised wings i would do that he said i can't go home to my wife and kids as ramrod and so and and wings did you know wings did a couple of villain parts after that um uh, sydney lamette uh put him in soldier story um, which I had recommended him for, and uh, he was great in that. And then um, there were other people that would, would, Walter Hill called me and said, is he as good as he is, you know, as, as he appears to be? And I said, yeah. He said, I said, I got a great part for him. I said, go for it, man. He's He's fantastic. And then Walter calls me like a week later and says, that motherfucker turned me down. <laughs> I said, what? He said, he turned down the part. And I I called Wings. I said, are you nuts? You just turned down a part in a Walter Hill film? And he says, yeah, I don't want to play villains anymore. And I said, you're crazy. And he said, no, no, no. I'm, I'm not. I'm never playing that, that. I'm never playing evil again. I can't. I can't deal with it and um boom so he he was like he said to me you were in my life he said i wanted to be an actor and play nice guys and now everybody wants me to play villains i said because you're great at it <laughs> ramrod's one of the great roles ever and and you know your performance was absolutely unbelievable I mean, even, you know, Marty Scorsese was like screaming at people that Wings should have gotten best actor that year at the Oscars. Mm -hmm. And um, um, 
you know, but back in those days, a film like Vice Squad did not get considered for the Academy Awards. <laughs> you know, one thing that stood out to me in the beginning of the movie, you have the caption that most of what we see in the movie is based on actual like LAPD cases that went on all through Hollywood. And I have this one burning question I got to ask you when it comes to season Hubley and all the Johns that she goes to halfway through the movie. That scene with her dressed as the bride going into <laughs> that little parlor. Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> that was an actual, there was a guy who lived in Hancock Park um, who used to send his chauffeur out to pick up prostitutes to bring them back and dress them up as a bride and he liked to scare the shit out of them and 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 so that came from an actual case that uh the the, the guy who wrote the original script was a vice cop and in all of these all of the events in this thing were based on stuff that happened during his career not at all one not all in one night but at least you know across a months of his career and um uh and then i i took all those stories and you know with with rvo and we we rewrote it all and made it into a screenplay um and uh but that but then you know i had john alcott you know john and i had been friends for for forever because we used to shoot commercials together in, in london and Johnny kept saying to me, I want to do a down and dirty movie. I'm too tired of doing, you know, Stanley Kubrick monster movies. He says, I, I really want to, he says, you, you got to do that for me. He says, you used to do that for me with commercials. So now you got to do that for me in a feature. So anyways, when I got offered Vice Squad, I got picked up the phone and called John and said, want to come to LA and do a real down and dirty? And he said, send me a ticket. I'll be there. So once I had John on, so when we were doing the when we were setting up pre-production to talk about this scene i said to john i said you know what you're gonna bury lind in this scene he said what do you mean he said no i'm not bringing a generator you got to do the whole thing with candles just like you did uh barry linden and he said oh don't do that to me i said no <laughs> and he finally said okay i'll do it so that whole sequence is lit with candles there's no electric lights yes. <laughs> so <laughs> we were having fun we you know i had just come off of dead and buried and had a blast on dead and buried and basically pulled the whole same crew for except you know, except for, uh, you know, Johnny, because I had Johnny and Stevie Poster was already booked on something else, or it would have been Steve Poster that did Vice Squad, because <laughs> he did such a great job on, on uh, Dead and Buried. But, um, you know, it was a chance to work with Johnny, and it was great. But, you know, almost everybody else, I mean, I, I had all my regular crew so it was quite fun so there's a lot of familiar faces in this movie of course like you had nina blackwood before she became an mtv vj uh peppy serena was in it and then i see fred berry from <laughs> what's happening playing a pimp who gets castrated how did that come did he audition for that or was it like no. let's just <laughs> Some the, we we had a, a mutual friend and at the time fred wasn't working very much and and he basically needed needed to do a sag job so that he could renew his insurance <laughs> and i thought i said ah, absolutely i mean if if he wants to play this part he's got the part i didn't audition him i just called him up and said here's the part you want to do it? And he said, Oh man, thank you. Yes, I would love to do it. You know, and uh do the open. You know, I, it, it was great. It was great working with him. He was absolutely fabulous. You know, it was a, it was at a time that it was hard. Um the the world wasn't too open to to 
uh, you know, um, gay actors at that time. I mean, and, uh, you know, Fred had kind of come out. And so it was, it was a time that was hard for him to get work. So and then, unfortunately, he passed away at a pretty early age. Um, but it was great working with Fred. I mean, we, we had we had a lot of. I'm telling you, doing Dead and Buried and and Vice Squad back to back was just uh, <laughs> really fun because I had I I never had as much fun as making those two movies. Um, why on those two particular films are you Fred Gary? A Sherman, where all your other film, it's Gary Sherman. Um, I don't know. I I just uh, I uh, it was just a decision. I bet. Um, you know, Jay Cantor and Alan Led Jr. always used to tell me, "Why don't you change your name?" to Shermanovsky or something. You know, Sherman's just too white bread. <laughs> and, you know, but I just thought, well, Gary A. Sherman, maybe that sounds different. And then I went, ah, it doesn't. <laughs> How did Wanted Dead or Alive come about? How did you get the rights from the Steve McQueen TV show to modernize it into a movie? I didn't. Arthur Sarkisian did. And um I, I was, God, I was knee deep. Actually, I was chest deep in television at that point. I had, I had a bunch of pilots going on and I was really quite enjoying um, my life and in, in doing television. I was at Lorimar and, uh, you know, and I was just doing one, one pilot and, you know, and, and putting shows on the air and, having a great time and um uh and being able to do everything that i wanted to do i, di I didn't have to have a body count in my television shows which was kind of nice um you can only kill so many people <laughs> before you start feeling guilty <laughs> and um so anyways i was doing that and um bob ramey called me and Bob Ramey uh, had been a real uh, hero to me um, through my early career. He was the president of Avco Embassy. I, I did Dead and Buried and um, uh, and Vice Squad under his, you know, leadership of, of the studio, and so I. And he really protected me. And I mean, you know, Vice Squad was absolutely my movie because Bob Ramey, from the time I started on that movie, because Sandy Howard was the producer and Sandy had a reputation for like taking over from directors. And when Bob asked me to do to do Vice Squad. Um, with Sandy, he said, I'll protect you from Sandy. Sandy won't. He, it's a Gary Sherman film, not a Sandy Howard film, and he did, and so I felt a real obligation to to Bob, and um, Bob called me and said, "I got a script here. We through Arthur Sarkisian, we bought the title Wanted Dead or Alive, based just on the title. We booked this film into into theaters." We've got a release date. We, we've got the, the director's possible director strike pending. We need to move on this project. I just got the script and the script is not only unreadable, it's unmakeable, it's awful. Can you come in and grab the script and read it and tell me what you think? So um, at that time you couldn't, email a script so i <laughs> they sent it by a, a, a messenger they brought me the script i sat down i read the script and bob said as soon as you finish reading the script come into the office and so i read the script i 
jumped in my car, drove down to the studio. And uh, he said, what do you think? I said, I think you need to throw this script away and start from scratch. First of all, it has nothing to do with the title. The characters are absolutely abysmal. The story doesn't work at all. And he said, can you save it? And I said, yeah, we'll throw it away and start from scratch. He said, I need a script that we can start to pre-production on within two weeks. <laughs> I laughed. I said, God. Well, Denise DeNovi, who went on to produce the first Batman movie, was, was his story person at the studio at that time. And Denise says to me, or I said, I, I'm going to need a co-writer on this. There's no way in two weeks I can turn a script out myself. And she said, I got the perfect person for you. And at that point is when she introduced me to Brian Taggart. And Brian and I went on to write a lot of movies together in the future. It was Brian and I were just a team made for each other. Um, and I, I had dinner with Brian that night. And by the morning, we had a story beaten out. And we, we went into Bob's office and pitched the story. He said, I love it. Go write it. And he put us in an office with Arthur Sarkissian, who was the producer of the movie. And, uh, and it was the first time we had a computer. I mean, <laughs> I didn't even, you know, I had no idea. And we had a guy who knew how to enter everything on the computer. And it's the first script I ever wrote on a computer. Um, I mean, actually, Brian and I were just working on a typewriter, and we'd give the pages to this guy who was inputting it into a, into a word processor. And uh, it, it was pretty fun. Um, and so anyways, we... we we wrote the script and it was really funny. We got all the way to the end of the script and we couldn't figure out a really dynamic ending. <laughs> and I suddenly turned to Brian and I said, he stuffs a hand grenade into, into Malak's mouth and ties it up like he's got a toothache with his kafia, and then walks him out by the ring and then pulls the ring and says fuck the bonus <laughs> <laughs> and brian goes oh my god fuck the bonus <laughs> and we start screaming jumping up and down arthur sarkissian comes running into the office and says what are you guys screaming about and we said fuck the bonus and he said what and we told him what that meant and he gets crazy and to do next thing we were in Ramey's office showing him this thing with fuck the bonus and they said Ta -da, let's do it so um do do so anyways so that's that's how it all happened and we we kept writing all the way through with making the movie because we never really had a finished script and, and uh, you know, I, I mean, my only thing about Wanted Dead or Alive is I think the movie's so much better than the screenplay. I wish I would have had more time to work on the screenplay. But, uh, you know, and working with Rutger it was really fun. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Was he your first choice or were there other actors you considered for Nick Randall? No, he wasn't my first choice. Um, my 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 first choice was Mad Max. <laughs> I had just seen Mad Max, which wasn't really a big hit yet in 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 the United States. And I said, "God, we got to get that Australian guy to come." <laughs> and anyways, everybody knew that he was going to be a big star. And uh, um, and they were asking a lot of money. And then somebody came up with Rutger Hauer and said, well, Rutger Hauer is just as big a star, if not a bigger star, we can get him for less money and do do And uh, I, I kind of fought uh, 
for where I wanted to go with it, but um, Rutger, Rutger won. And so we made it with Rutger. I think had it gone the other way, Wanted Dead or Alive would have been a major blockbuster movie. But uh, uh, didn't. <laughs> um, uh, how did Gene Simmons get involved in the project, considering he had limited acting experience, of course, is a rock star? Okay, here we go. <laughs> you know, we're under real pressure to get this movie made, and I'm sitting in my office or our, our offices. Um, and we're, you know, just trying to get it done. And we, you know, had cast Rutger and we were casting people around Rutger. And we were talking, we had several people we were looking at to play Malach al-Rahim. And Judy, my assistant, comes walking into the office and says, Gary, Gene Simmons is on the phone for you, you know, from KISS. And I said, I don't know Gene Simmons. I've never met Gene Simmons. And um, she says, uh, well, he said he wants to talk to you. It's important. And I said, you know what? I got so much on my plate. I'll, I'll just get a number. I'll call him back. So he kept calling me back. He called me like four times that day. And I was in meetings and stuff. And at one of the meetings I was in was with, with um with Arthur, and Arthur says, what does Gene Simmons want? I said, he wants to play a part in the movie. And I said, that's all I need is this, some fucking drugged out rock and roller with the pressure that we've got making this movie. And Arthur says to me, talk to him. I said, why? He said, even if you don't put, put, you know, cast him, we could get him to write some music for the, for the film. So I said, okay, I'll talk to him. So I said, Judy, put the call through. And I pick up the phone and I get, hello, Mr. Sherman. This is Mr. Gene Simmons. And I would very much like to have a conversation with you. I'm going, this is Gene Simmons. I mean, with this incredible speaking voice and boom, boom. And he says, I am... Um, I read the script and I love the part of Malach al Rakim. And he says, you know, he said, I speak fluent Hebrew. I speak five dialects of Arabic. Um, and, uh, and he says, I, I could be quite a bit of help to you on this film uh, because I could do translations for you. I could, you know, do all of that. And I really want to play this part. And he said, I'm in Detroit right now. But I have my own plane, so I could fly in tomorrow morning and um, we could have lunch. And then I can be back in Detroit for my show tomorrow night. I said, I, I can't promise anything, Gene, but if you know, if you want to do this and do do, he said, yes, yes, yes. So I said, OK, it's, it's, you know, you're 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 calling the shot here. So. Anyways, the next day, Gene flew in. I met him for lunch. I was absolutely blown away. One of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Not only is he not a drugged out rocker, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do drugs. He's clean as a whistle. His only problem is that if he doesn't get his dick wet three times a day, he does. He thinks it's going to fall off. But um, I mean, he's totally sexually addicted, but that's, that wasn't my problem. <laughs> and, um, anyways, he, he read, for, he actually read for the part. He, he was absolutely fantastic in the reading. And I said, okay. And Gene Simmons was now part of the show. <laughs> so we got to be quite, we were quite good friends for a while. I just got to the point that. Gene had turned so right wing, I, I just couldn't have a conversation with him. He's a, you know, he's a, he's become a real Trumpster, and I just uh, can't deal with that. <laughs> um, um, the the bombing scene in the movie, 
Um, was it intentional for them to bomb Rambo of all? <laughs> And when yeah, I picked that out. I thought that would be cool. I mean, I had that choice. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a theater showing Rambo. We put <laughs> we put Rambo up on the marquee, but I just thought that that would be uh, it would be funny. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You know, we, we did. That explosion, everything was built to do that explosion on the front of a real theater. And we did like $500 damage to the front of that theater in that explosion. That's how good the special effects guys were. It, and it, I mean, that wasn't CGI. We didn't have CGI back then. We actually did the explosion, but the way that it was built and the way that the fireball was built and, and, um, they were able to do that fireball without that fireball, you know, generating the kind of heat that you would think came out of that fireball. It was really, uh, Cal Acord was the special effects guy on that picture. He just did a great job. <laughs> so blowing up the boat as well. Well, yeah, like all your special effects are open and practical, which, you know, yeah. I'm a I do practical effects. I mean, even when we did, you know, the dreaded Poltergeist 3, the, the only thing that I really like about that film is that there's not an optical or, or anything in that entire film. Every effect is practical. We shot it on the, on the set. Nothing is post-production. Um, move on from uh, Wanda Life. I have to ask you about Robert Golame and working with him because he's a legend and seems like one of the nicest guys on earth. Us growing up with him on Benson. What was that experience like working with him? I I wanted him from the beginning for that part. I mean, everybody said to me, well, why, why would he do that? And I said, I, I just, I want him for that part. And I knew his manager. And I called him um, and said, you know, I, I really want Robert for this part. And so he said, well, he'll meet with you. And I went over to his house. And, um, if you'll excuse my, where I'm going with this, I don't know if you don't want to put this on your thing. And, I, you know, I, I grew up, I'm not trying to toot my horn, but my dad was was very involved in civil rights, and I, I grew up in a in a household that was totally colorblind. I mean, my dad always told me it isn't this that counts; it's this. It's the heart. You got to look at what who people are, not what they look like, who they are. I mean, my my home from from the time that I was, you know, a, a little baby was filled with the diversity like nobody's house was filled with in the 50s. I mean, my my dad had friends of every race and ethnicity and sexual orientation and um to do and so I was surrounded by this my my whole life. So anyways, when I went in to to meet with Bob, he said, "Why why are you picking me for this part?" And I just looked at him and I said, because this character has to be an uppity mm. and you're the best person in the world to play that part. And he just jumped up and came across the room and hugged me. And he said, I can't believe that anybody had the balls to say that to me. And he, and he says, and I know it came from your heart. And and to do, and he and I just became, we, we were great friends through making that picture and then when he got ill and uh and we didn't live that far away from each other and i used to go visit him all the time you know when he was getting sicker and sicker and and his body was being taken away from him um which was pretty awful but uh, what a lovely man i, I just absolutely adored mr guillaume he was just such a gentleman and such a pleasure to work with. And and, and like I said, we, it just, 
he'd still be my friend if he was still alive. Same. Um, but um, yeah, that, I'm very emotional about that because I. Okay. Well, take your time. Yeah. Um, my next question now seems so silly after that. Um, I was going to ask you who had the better hair, Rudger Hauer or William Russ? Because they're both working with some <laughs> big dudes in that movie. <laughs> Rutgers hair was very important to him and then and and basically I had to cast somebody that you know kind of had the same kind of uh thing going on and then we had the wig that we built for <laughs> for Bill Russ Bill Russ was, is great it, what a wonderful actor and he went on to have an incredible career oh yes <laughs> uh he he just was a really good guy it was really fun that that scene with the motorcycle <laughs> in the loft was so much fun with those two guys to shoot that scene i i just had a blast you know making movies is really hard work as i'm sure you guys know and if you can't have fun doing it then why do it <laughs> and and i've just had a great time you know my wife keeps saying to me you should retire you should retire and i go why <laughs> i'll be a blast you know i just love i i'm not sure i want to direct but producing and writing i i just can't stop doing directing might be a little hard i mean if the right thing came along i might direct something but for the most part i'm quite happy uh writing and producing so i know our time is getting a little bit limited but i wanted to ask you about lisa and just two questions how did that idea come about and working with dw moffitt was he like also doing the method thing like Wingshauser when he was on set well i knew dw um i had worked with him in something else uh Actually, I'd seen DW in a whole bunch of casting sessions for other things that I was doing for commercials and for um, television. And I was always looking for a part for him because I thought he was really talented. You know? It was like somebody else in my earlier career who I felt that way about, a guy named Robert England. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Robert and I are still friends. He calls me his pre-Freddy friend because I, I cast Robert in two movies before uh, before he became Freddy, and uh, and and we were we were buddies. And I, Robert and his wife and I were like we keep running into each other at film festivals all over the world, and we just have the best time. Um, <laughs> But anyways, D.W. was a very talented actor. Lisa went through some changes. We we originally were going to do Lisa. We had a deal at MGM to do Lisa. I wrote Lisa for my daughter. My, my daughter was a teenager at the time. And she was she always complained that her mother wouldn't let her see any of my films because all my films were R rated and um if not x and uh back in those days and so her mother and i were friends but we were we had been divorced for a long time and um uh and her mother was very adamant that she couldn't see money in my movie so melissa my daughter kept saying to me you gotta make a movie i can see you gotta make a movie i can see so or at least write a script that I can read. So I wrote the script, Lisa, for my daughter, just as a thing. I mean, just so that she could read something that I'd written. And so I wrote a, a, a thriller for teenage girls. And, um, uh, and she loved it. She just was all excited about it. Well, anyways, after the, 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 the debacle that, that, that Poltergeist 3 became after Heather died. MGM thanked me for finishing the film because I didn't want to finish the film. 
nor, neither did the head of the studio, but the board said we had to finish the film. And um, uh, so uh, the studio said to me, you know what, bring us any script you want to make and we'll make it as a thank you for you finishing Poltergeist. And I brought him Lisa and and Dick Berger, who was running the studio at that time, because Jay and Laddie had left and gone to Warner Brothers. Um, uh, said, uh, you know what, I would have made this script even if I hadn't made you that promise. It's a really good script. Anyways, we started pre-production. The studio went into bankruptcy. MGM was put into bankruptcy. They shut down the movie because they didn't have the money to make it. It was budgeted at 17 million or 16 something, close to 17 million. And um, we were gonna cast really high on it. And that was a lot of money to make a movie with back then. And um, uh, but well, long story short, we, we tried to turn it around to Warner Brothers and MGM, because of the fact that they were in bankruptcy, could not release the script because it was a valued asset in the bankruptcy. And they said, we can't make it and we can't. So Frank Blondes, who was going to produce it with me, you know, formerly been president of Paramount. Um, Frank said, why don't you and I finance the film? Can we make the film for five million instead of 17 million? And I said, yeah, if we don't get paid. And he said, yeah, well, I'll throw in my salary. You throw in yours. All no-name casting and boop, boop. And, uh, and we'll shoot it here in Los Angeles instead of taking it to Chicago, which, we had orig which I had originally written it for. And, you know, we'll do it. And so we figured out how to do it. And that's what we did. And so Frank and I put up the between the two of us we put up the five million dollars i wanted to make i i didn't want the script to just never get made and it would have never gotten made um but it was really tough and so anyways i i knew dw and that's how dw ended up with that part because i didn't have any money to pay an actor for that part and cheryl ladd was a friend and um, MGM was happy to have Cheryl and they, they, they would pay her because the Japanese sale on the film alone would pay her salary. And so they gave me, they, they gave me Cheryl. Who, I mean, I love Cheryl as a friend. I, I didn't think she was the right person for the movie. Um, but she did a really good job. She was really good in it. So anyways, um, that's what we did, and uh, well, and so we made the film the way we made the film, and um, and then MGM screwed us in the end, anyways, because w the fact that we owned the movie and we put up the money, we had theatrical and they had ancillary, mm -hmm. and so what they did is they put the film out for one week in theaters and then they sold it off to Lifetime Television even though we were doing the first weekend we did nearly seven thousand dollars a screen which at that time was star wars money the Ooh. film was a giant hit but they weren't making money off of it so they didn't care they wanted they wanted the ancillary so they sold it to lifetime television and they kind of disappeared and that's when i decided i wanted to retire <laughs> at least from movies <laughs> so at that point i dived completely into television and i haven't done a movie since then no uh because i mean you know they just uh after you know losing heather on poltergeist 3 and ending up with a movie that i didn't really want because we were 17 pages short when Heather died and I had to stretch the movie and change it around and then go from that into a movie that I really loved and really wanted to do and then ended up having to do it in a way that I didn't want to do it 
and then have the film just ripped out from under us and sold off as a television movie. I said, you know what? Television has been very good to me and features suck. <laughs> I'm going back to television. And that's what I did. And that's what I've done. Wow, it's a whole new medium compared to film these days. So, yeah. Probably... Oh, I love television. <laughs> I love it. And, and, and it is. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm so glad to have really committed myself to television and what has really become the golden age of television. Yes, and, um, you know, I've, I've got four pilots in development right now. Um, and uh, well, two are done. And um, uh, waiting with bated breath the networks to say we're, we're picked up so that I know what I'm doing next year. <laughs> and, you know, and I, and I have a favorite of them, which is the longest shot of, of any of them, but I'm hoping that that one happens. So I, I, I could tell you it's a secret. Don't tell anybody, <laughs> but Jeremy Dyson, you know, who created League of Gentlemen and um, is probably the hottest writer in England. He he and I co-wrote a pilot to turn Deathline into a television series. Mm. Wow. And are well based on inspired by Deathline. It it isn't Deathline, but it is Deathline. And um we'll see what happens. It's out there. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That, that, that was probably the least likely of any of it to happen, but, um, you know, but we're trying. <laughs> All you can do. <laughs> uh, Jeff, any last questions before we start closing? Uh, no. That's overjoyed with all the information gotten so far yeah gary that this was really appreciate your time today and answering all the questions that we have i mean there was so much more but we know your time is very limited so just thank you for this and just sharing all your memories and the fact that you're still doing it i think is an inspiration to all of us yeah well another year and a half i'll be 80 and i'm still going at it so <laughs> what can i tell you I mean, 50, hers five, could do it. five years. <laughs> uh, um, well, let me just say before we go, um, thank you for your film work. Uh, they helped to inspire, obviously, not only my imagination, but a bunch of artists and fans out there, especially as a kid. It scared me to the late, but it opened up a new world that maybe and others want to watch for your films are never what they seem and offer more than what they expect. Discovering you were behind so many films later in my life, that still fascinated me, like, as well as bring so many memories to so many of us, especially as at first they seem so simple, but again, you take us on a journey, a roller coaster, you know, and, and they're just so technically mm -hmm. achievement. And like you said before, fun overall despite whatever the subject matter is and thank you for not only being a good storyteller and visually painting a picture for us but for helping us believe in the magic of the stories that you are telling thank you thank you for, for watching <laughs> <laughs> i mean i i do it for you i don't do it for me i i i, I do it for my audience and i i just I love my audiences and it's it just been amazing, you know, since the, 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 the redone version that since Blue Underground, you know, restored Deathline for mm -hmm. the second time, but the, 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 the 4K Blu-ray um, of Deathline and Dead and Buried that they've done are just really amazing. And I've traveled all over the world speaking about those movies. And I, I stand up there, especially with Deathline, and I look out at an audience whose parents weren't born when I made the movie. And they're fans, you know, and it's thrilling. And, and that's, that's why I do what I do. I do it to entertain 
my audiences and I it's it just thrilling for me so I'm happy <laughs> um is there anything you'd like uh to plug or where fans can find you at uh, Gary no I mean you know I'm if I knew I was going, I would plug it. But, you know, we're getting into the Christmas season here and we're just finding out what what's going to get picked up for next season. And, uh, doo -doo, I'm, you know, I've got one project that I'm hoping, uh, one I didn't talk about, but I've been doing a documentary about a rehab program at Cook County Jail that uh, uh, yes it's a documentary but it's so emotional and it's so moving and it's just an amazing program which is the the normal recidivism rate at cook county jail is about 80 percent 83 percent of uh, inmates at cook county jail are back in within two years in this program which has been running now for about six years of of the inmates uh over 200 inmates who have gone through the program and have been released back into society only one of them is back in jail mm. and and i i just it, it just gives opportunity it's just an amazing program a run by an amazing person a, a chef named bruno abate who has just given back to society like it's unbelievable and uh to watch what what these guys and now women because this year is the first year that they've opened the program in the women's prison as well as the men's mm -hmm. and it's just uh it's just amazing to to see what they're doing and i'm so proud of the fact that i helped you know build this program with shooting footage for bruno that he could show to people to raise money unfortunately you know there's very few privately or publicly funded rehabilitation programs in this country and we have prisons for profit in this country which is a disgrace which is a total disgrace and um you know obama tried to end it but then when trump came in they all reopened again and uh do -do. and it, it's just a it's just awful and th this this program is exactly the opposite of of what the prisons for profit are and because prisons for profit don't want the 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 inmates re rehabilitated because they'd be getting rid of their clients you know and um you know the, the 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 whole idea of prisons for punishment is stupid prisons should be for rehabilitation and like like they are you know in the scandinavian countries where people are sentenced on how long it's going to take them to rehabilitate them rather than the severity of their crime and um anyways do i i'll get off my political <laughs> oh no I, that's something i'll be very seen when it's <laughs> Mm. yeah so anyhow hopefully serving time will will get on the air we mm. we've had a lot of problems trying to get it on the air because this the, the networks even though they're friendly to me and i've given them hit shows they say hey that, you know this is too soft how often do these guys fight and i said they can't fight it's zero tolerance because they they get into a fight they're out of the program they say well where's the drama then and but it, it we we are now looking at some networks that are interested in showing that people can be rehabilitated and that, and that and that this the drama is that people's lives are turned around so you know you've got kids who made a stupid mistake and then they spend the rest of their life in jail and once they get into that thing when you get out of jail it's easier to get a gun than it is to get a job oh yes so we we have to change that 
Definitely. So, so anyhow, I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know if you guys knew you were going to get into political treatises in this <laughs> conversation. Oh, this is all good. I enjoyed this. Yeah, we all, we welcome all kinds of discussions. It doesn't matter. Um, but uh, thank you again for being here and talking with us or spending some time with us. Uh, hopefully, uh, we can talk to you again, especially if serving time does go to a network. We'd love to have you back or just, hey, shoot the shit, you know? <laughs> you never know. Okay. <laughs> this, was, this was fun. Great questions, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that ends our business for this episode, but there's always unfinished business out there. And thank you for being here and thank you fans for watching this interview and we hope to bring you more soon. Okay. Talk to you guys soon. All right. Thank, thank you, Gary. Gary. Thank you. Gary. Thank you. Thank you. If you like this review, please be sure to like and hit subscribe to be alerted to new episodes in the future.